Um, I'm happy to talk about positioning in highly competitive markets. And so um, let's tr let's go through this. Okay, and so if you've ever said, uh, you know, when you feel like you're losing business to competitors, uh, or you feel like you're in a commodity market, and uh, also if you fear new competitors might come into your market, uh, this is a time to really reconsider uh, your positioning because uh, positioning is what people hear and your brand and that's how they feel about it. Okay, so um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to be showing you some techniques uh, that these companies know how to transform a commodity. So if you think about um, a commodity like Snickers or whatever, they're just dealing with chocolate and nuts. And that's basically all they have is a couple of things, but they've been able to really get out of this idea of being a, just a pure commodity. Okay, so um, the first thing we're going to look at is segmenting your market and uh, doing it in a way that will allow you to see exactly what's going on. Okay, because segmentation has to be done on benefits rather than the way most people especially in B2B, uh, start thinking about segmentation because, uh, uh, and I'll show you why in a second here. So uh, this won't really help you see what's going on in B2B. And I know that a lot of people, you know, the way that they segment their market is by verticals or uh, location or age or growth rate and all of these things. I, this is actually the, these are, this is actually a, a slide from Forrester. And uh, if you think this is crazy, you should go over to uh, what's going on in uh, markets like uh, B2C, okay? Because in B2C, uh, you know, uh, uh, what, what's happening is that uh, they just have like tons of different ways of being able to segment their market. Uh, but um, let's think about a different way. Okay, so I want to ask you a question. Why do you buy gasoline at the gas station? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, do you go to the gas station because you love gas? <laughs> is that what you're really buying? Is gas? Well, Vera Levitt said, let's start at the beginning. <laughs> Customer. It can be shown that motors strongly dislike the bother, delay, and experiences of buying gasoline. People actually do not buy gasoline. What they buy is the right to continue driving their cars, okay? So that's the benefit. That's what they're getting. It's not the gasoline that they want. It's, it's they want to be able to drive their car, right? Isn't that what happens to you? Okay. So uh, it turns out that there's three types of benefits uh, we're, you know, uh, that, and that characterize all markets. And when I think all markets, I'm talking about B to C, B to G, B to uh, B to B. Uh, one of those is what we call functional benefits. Okay, so functional benefits uh, kind of conserve energy or money or time or something like that. But there's also uh, uh, experiential benefits. Have you ever been to a restaurant and had a really great meal? That's an example of an experiential benefit because you experience it through your senses. But there's also symbolic benefits. And symbolic benefits are like where, where it has to, has to do with like who the person that you are. Now these benefits work in all, every single market in the world, including everything from uh, B2B all the way to uh, nonprofits, even national parks or whatever. Okay, but let's just talk about like, you know, um, functional benefits, because that's really what makes up most of the markets that I've worked with. As, a, as uh, Brie was saying before, I started doing this years ago with uh, Intel. They sent me worldwide to talk about these kinds of ideas. Uh, and so look at these two benefits. Like one of, one of them is it's like reliable, right? It doesn't break down and cause problems. And what happens is it solves a problem when you have something that's reliable because you don't have to go out and, and deal with it. Or it's easy to install, which really conserves resources. So this is an example of just what I mean when I talk about 
benefits that make up a market. So what we want to do is we, I'm going to show you an example because we want to get into these competitive markets. And we're just going to use a, a document management example. Uh, you all probably are familiar with document management because these are systems that are sold to companies uh, worldwide that capture and stores electronic documents. So um, this is an example of a segmentation, uh, something that I worked with this company that's in this market. It turns out that there's four segments in the market, and you can see one, two, three, four, and one is uh, a segment that really cares about ease of use and customized retrieval. Okay, segment two really cares about multiple data types. Segment three is someone that really cares about cost and compatibility. Okay, so with that, you know, once you have this segmentation, you can layer on top where competitors are. Now imagine that if you didn't do this segmentation or you did it by one of these like verticals or something like that, all you'd see is like a vertical like banks and that's it, or financial institutions or healthcare or something like that. But you wouldn't understand really where the competitors are. But when you do it this way, you can see the competitor A is going after segment two, competitor C is going after segment three and competitor D is going after segment four and competitor B is just somewhere in the middle there. Okay, so now you have a much better understanding of like maybe where you should be in this market because you can, if you go after segment two, you're gonna be basically going after with one competitor. But if you don't segment the market, you've got four competitors, okay? But in fact, you don't really have four competitors. And of course, if you do the segmentation this way, your competitors aren't doing it this way, I can tell you. And so uh, you'll be at a strategic advantage by doing it this way. Uh, this is a, a interesting because I'm writing a book uh, uh, that uh, will probably come out hopefully in the next year on positioning and all of this. And one of the examples that we did uh, was with the home exercise market. And so you can see like, you know, you can see these three, three segments that are there. There's one that really cares about convenience. That's the green area there. That's what they care about most. There's one that cares about it having it being enjoyable and entertaining. And then the third segment cares about status, identity, and ability to share, et cetera. Okay. Now imagine like you're in this market. And you can see that, you know, Peloton, like, for example, that right now they're doing this whole uh, campaign that really is going after this uh, group of people that are in the purple. But in fact, uh, they're just they're 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 not segmenting the market this way. So that they're, 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 it's landing on people who want convenience, but that doesn't really resonate with them, et cetera. So, you know, when we do this, you get a much better understanding of like how the market breaks out. And this is one way to start solving this when you think you're in a commodity because you have all these other competitors that are all around you. But now you start seeing that the market actually breaks out into these different segments. And once you see that, you get a, a, an idea of like where you can compete and where you, where you don't compete. Another way to look at the market, and this is a, a really important way, is with a perceptual map. As it turns out, the only way you know your positioning, this is the only way you know your positioning, is with a perceptual map. Because a perceptual map is, from, is, is based on the perceptions of customers in your market, okay? And that's how, when you say, my, my product is positioned, you're saying it's positioned, but that doesn't mean the customers in the market actually believe that positioning. Okay, so the only way to start seeing this, and this is also a way to understand how to break out of this commodity. So as I say here, look at the landscape from a customer's point of view. It might feel like you're in a commodity market, but is it really? Okay, well, here's an example of a perceptual map. Now, this is a perceptual map done with uh, multi-dimensional scaling and principal components, uh, which breaks down a market into two dimensions. But it gives you kind of a sense of like how the market is broken out and how customers actually perceive these uh, five brands on, uh, on, on these two dimensions of performance and ease of use, okay? Going from easy to use all the way to hard to use. 
And what happens is, here's a different market. This is goes back to this example of the uh, of the uh, home exercise market of a perceptual map. Uh, this is based on 500 responses, and so you can kind of see how Peloton is kind of like dominating. They have the highest price. Uh, Customers perceive them as having more uh, status, identity, et cetera, and more visually pleasing. They seem to dominate on all these different things. But let's say that you're Nordic track. Well, once you see this, you can say, oh, I think if I'm going after a segment that really cares about status identity, maybe I can do something about that. And there are ways to do things. And we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. But the perceptual map is key to understanding how customers in the market kind of perceive what's, what's, what's going on. Okay, how do you develop the perceptual map, somebody asks. Where do you get the data from to develop the map accurately? That's a good question, and thanks for asking that. Uh, well, uh, you know, we have a system uh, at Marketing Profs that was developed to actually get these perceptual maps. But the way the, the methodology is to ask customers at, well, let me, let me talk about the data here. There's, there's different ways to get data for doing this sort of stuff. I mean, one is, and the, one of the best ways is to get data from real customers. Okay. Uh, a second way is to use focus groups. You can actually do this with focus groups. And a third way uh, is to use uh, managerial judgment. And I've done this with a lot of companies where I've actually worked with people who were in both marketing and sales uh, because they have, if I can get them to be unbiased about like what's going on, you can actually get, uh, you know, get an idea of what the perceptual map might look like. And of course you can test that out with real customers. So, uh, but that's, that's a very reasonable question and uh, and uh, maybe we can talk about it a bit later. But in this case here, they were actually just using sliders to figure out how much they had. And then this was renormed on a 10 point scale. So you might ask about what, uh, what about features? And uh, features are, are important, uh, you know, because the features bring the benefits to life. And so when I talk about features, you know, it could be features for a service or it could be features for a product. And then what you kind of try to do is to provide those benefits that are better than the competition. Okay. So, uh, so like, for example, like, how do you, how do you do this? <laughs> you know, like, like, let's say again, going back to the example that I, that I said, if I was working, for example, with, uh, in this case here, uh, the mirror, and they were going to go after the status identity product uh, segment. How can you? How do you do this? How do you get people to uh, perceive that your brand is actually better? Well, this is called brand strength. Okay, and so what you're doing is trying to trying to instead of like differentiate in the market, which is the way a lot of people do things, is they say, okay. The way I need to get more business or get is to out, put this feature out, put this feature out, put this feature out, etc. Once you understand the market from benefits, it's a whole different world because now you're saying, okay, I understand I need to increase my this perception that status identity is really important, and uh, you can you can do this by really focusing on this part of the of the uh, market. So uh, the way one of, there's two ways to to increase status identity. If I was like talking to somebody at Mirror, uh, the first thing I would do is I would say, okay, what can we do in reality? Okay, what can we do in reality to actually increase stat this perception of status identity? And so you started thinking about, okay, what are features that I can actually have here that will bring uh, more a perception of status identity. Remember, it's the perception, not of you. You're, you're kind of like irrelevant in this. It's the perception of customers in the market, okay? Now, of course, you have to do perceived reality because what you've got to do is you've got to communicate those things, 
Okay, now in the reality step thing, this is like where you might think about, okay, we don't have these things, maybe we can partner with somebody else in our company to bring these things, or maybe, maybe we can do a partnership with somebody on the outside. But the point is, and this is the real point of this whole message here, is that when you do this, what you're focusing on is the status identity. And going back to the, 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 this example here, um, we could do the same thing for enjoyable and, and entertaining or the ability to share. In fact, if I was advising this company, I would advise them not to go after status identity because that's a big jump to make in perceptions. But look at, look at convenience, for example. Uh, Peloton has, has, has an advantage, but it's very minor. It's a very minor ad, ad, advantage. And if, if, if the mirror or Nordic track was going after a segment that really cared about convenience and they just messaged that and really messaged it, they could actually break out of that position that they're in. And that's, of course, the problem with a lot of companies is they don't have a perceptual map. So they, they don't, they don't know how they're positioned in the market, even though somebody's told them that this is their position. They don't know anything about that. And they're going after just some general kind of a group of customers like, you know, banks or something else. And, uh, and, you know, in that kind of a world, you know, you don't have a perceptual map. You don't have any idea of how customers are perceiving you and you're not segmenting the market in a way that really gives you a kind of like an advantage. So, uh, you know, these are, uh, these are, uh, these are, kinds of issues that, uh, you know, what we, we, uh, we, we think about when we're like doing these, uh, you know, this kind of analysis. So the next question is, you know, is, you know, is your positioning defensible? And with a perceptual map, you can clearly see where your com competition is positioned, as I said. And then the second thing is, wh what will the competition do if you change your position? What will you do if the competition changes their position? So to do this, you know, what you want to do is, you know, you, you look at this kind of a map and you say, okay, this is my brand. And the question is, is, is are people going to come in and just take away that position for you? And so one of the ways that you do this is you do it by having a much more kind of a, proactive, competitive way of thinking about this. And so uh, one of the ways that uh, what I do when I work with companies uh, is that, uh, you know, I take them through kind of a game theoretic way of thinking about that. So are they vulnerable? Will they respond? How will they respond? Do you have an effective counter response? How will they respond to your counter response? What will you do in response to that? And so what you're doing is you're thinking through before you make your move, okay, all the possible kinds of ways that the game might play out. And that's one of the ways that you can start thinking about like, okay, if I start to make this move, uh, what are my competitors going to do? Okay, I was just working with a Benafi, which is a, uh, a, 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 a large company in the um, a security space. And you could just see through the through the segmentation that, you know, Amazon was like playing in one part of the market. And uh, you could just see that the whole discussion that I had with this was the CEO and the CMO. And we were talking about this whole thing was, OK, if, if you go and you start to go into that segment of the market, Amazon's going to respond in a major way. And so they started thinking, OK, so we, maybe we need to start thinking about a different way to approach the entire market. And that, of course, happens when you start thinking in this kind of more dynamic sort of a way. Uh, let's see. Somebody asked, will the slides uh, be available? Yes. All right. So then the next question is, is, is your positioning credible? So, you know, you say you provide these benefits. What's it about your company that says that you can deliver these benefits better than the competition? And so this is a, this is really a matter of having a credible position in the market. And this also helps with this commodity market because now you have really good proof points 
that document exactly what's going on in terms of what customers are buying. So uh, one of the ways to do this is to like just uh, start thinking about like benefits. Okay, so I've just listed as an example here of, of, of four benefits that make up a market. Okay, so reliability, ease of insulation, performance, and low cost. And so the kind of the question is, okay, all right, now look internally and say, okay, what is about my company that says that I can really provide this reliability? Okay, what is it about my company that says that I can really provide this ease of installation? Okay, is there something about my history or something like that? What about performance or low cost? Like when I was working, doing a lot of work with Texas Instruments, you know, their, their major, their major uh, uh, core competency or their competency that they had was their ability to drive manufacturing costs down. And so anytime that they would go into a market segment that cared about low cost, they were extremely credible for doing that type of a targeting because they could not only say that we have low cost, but we have this history, this 50 year history of driving manufacturing costs down. That makes it more, that makes the whole thing more credible. Okay. And so, uh, you know, so let's just take stock and think about what we've, what we've been doing here. You know, when we're sitting there in this kind of commodity market and it looks like this company's coming at us and this company's coming at us, et cetera, and it just feels kind of overwhelming. And so what we're doing here is like we started by just thinking about, okay, so how do we, how do we break out this market in a much more meaningful manner? How do we get the perceptions or an idea of what customers are thinking about when they're thinking about like buying our product versus somebody else? Okay, so these are like the benefits that are going on and understanding the perceptions. And then what we did was we said, okay, well, look at if we're going to position ourselves in this market and do it much more clearly in a, in a very specified way, we have to think defensively about like, okay, we're not going to just go in there and our competitors are going to do nothing. They're going to react to you. So you play out this game, okay? And this game helps you to decide whether or not maybe that's a good idea for you to position yourself that way. And then what we did on this slide here is we're really kind of like saying, okay, are the benefits that we're saying out to the market, are they really credible that we're saying that? Or maybe a word that you might use is believable. Do people really believe us when we say that we're really easy, uh, easy to install? Okay. So you know you can see like you know just this weekend, for example, Rackspace. Uh, you know they they they've always said to the, they've said to everybody like oh we have fanatical service. Okay, we have really fanatical service, and that's been their whole their whole deal. Well, I don't know if you've read about this, but Rackspace kind of collapsed their, their email system and millions of customers around the world didn't have email starting on Friday, et cetera. And that what they did was they came out and they said like every 12 hours, they said, we're working on it. We're working on it. And you could just see this fanatical perception of fanatical service just go down and down and down and I, I can guarantee you if I did a perceptual map for them they would see that they're really suffering in that particular area right now so uh, let me see if there's any questions here about this that we're doing should you focus on uh, let's see should you focus on one or more of these uh you're uh, Stephen thanks for that question you're asking the question should you focus on one or more of these uh segments is that uh, if that's correct well, let me let me ask answer it in a couple of ways. Okay. Uh, oh, I see. Okay, core competency. Well, okay, core. First of all, core core competencies uh, comes from uh, uh, from a paper that was done uh, by Prahlad and Hamel. When they discussed core competencies, their whole thing was when was that exactly what I'm showing in this in this in this slide here. They, they said that a core competency is when you have 
a strength in your organization that's purpose is to, in fact, be bring a benefit to the market. Okay, so this is like just but this is just a, a necessary condition. The other parts of core competencies is they can't depreciate over time. They can't be imitated by competitors. And in fact, uh, that they're used throughout the organization to actually expand into other markets, et cetera. So core competencies, uh, I've really raised the bar here by calling core competencies, but minimally you just need strengths that really map into these benefits. Okay, so uh, when you do this work, what roles are involved? Uh, let me let me let me uh, let me answer uh, ask answer that uh, at, to make sure that I get through the presentation. And but I, these are all really good questions that uh, that I that I want to answer for you. So let me let me talk a little bit about how competitors enter the market, because this is one of the questions that people have when they say, okay. I'm, I'm afraid that somebody else is going to come out to, to uh, uh, you know, kind of come into my market, which is very a, a very reasonable question to have. Well, you know, if you think about like how competitors enter, like the narrowest market are the products of your most direct competitors, and so that's really what people think. They they think at this level, products of your most direct competitors. You can think of a broader market which is really where you have a product category or you have an industry or even like some of the ways that people have segmented markets by verticals etc uh, a higher way of thinking about the market is really the way that i've been talking about it which are the benefits that make up the market now you might ans ask the question okay so when competitors enter into my market how do they do this how do they how do they do this well, first of all, if you're positioning here, you won't see competitors enter, okay? You, you just will not see them enter. And if you position at the higher ranks, you will be able to see them enter. Okay, let me give you an example of this so that you understand. All right, here's what happens when you, when you narrowly define a market. So remember the taxi industry? <laughs> all right, so the taxi industry has been around for a really long time. And if you ever talk to a taxi driver, you know, they, they, their whole concern was my medallion, my geographic territory, and all of this other sort of stuff. And they focus, if you looked at the, what really like the benefits, although they never talked about this, was uh, reliability, which a lot of people <laughs> wondered about, uh, punctuality, price, and safety. Okay, that's, that's, those are like the benefits that they, that, that, that that they were like thinking about. Okay, so how did Uber come in? Well, Uber just came in with benefits. They, they, they gave people a sense of control, okay? We all want sense of control, right? You know, and, and apps have been around. I mean, these guys came around years after apps have been around. And, uh, you know, they, the, it just gave them a sense of control. I know where the taxi is or my Uber driver is. And they, they also understood that when people left a taxi, they felt guilty because taxi drivers would say, okay, how much are you gonna pay me? Uh, is there gonna be a tip and all of that? And you had to make sure you had the right cash and they weren't really taking credit cards and all of that. And they said, okay, I wanna just make it so I can pay really easily, ease of use. So what they did was they came in and they completely blew out this market by coming in with a, uh, providing the benefits of a sense of control and ease of use. So if you, you want to stay on top of competition, and uh, uh, the best way to stay on top of competition is to think about these benefits, because that's how competitors, they always enter, even though they don't know it, they always enter by virtue of these kinds of, uh, of companies. Yeah. Yeah, it was also about being on demand. Yeah, exactly. And everybody want they wanted that, the Robin, right? I mean, didn't people really want this kind of thing? Like, you know, uh, I can just like when I need it, I just kind of click on something, and uh, and somebody's going to come. Uh, you know, you'd have to call, get on the phone, and you'd have to call the taxi company, and it just became a real mess. 
And so uh, this is a classic example of, you know, the kinds of things that I've, I've been talking about. So let's recap a little bit about what's going on, and then I'm going to answer some of these questions. Competition pressures, you know, they can be accurately assessed with a benefit-based segmentation and a perceptual map. This gives you a better view, a clear view of, of what's really going on. As I said, benefit segmentation will show you if there's more space for you to target, okay? And uh, if you want to break out of the pack, then focus on and increase the benefits that customers want. I'll give you one more example of, of this. Uh, you know, the beer market's been around since the, since the beginning of time. And what people don't realize is that in the 1970s, it turns out that uh, uh, Miller did actually a segmentation uh, and a perceptual map study of the beer market. This is, again, this is beer, so it's much more B to C, but these people have been in commodities for years, and so it makes sense for them to start thinking about this then. It was actually, it was actually through the perceptual map that they saw that there was no company positioned for a light beer, okay? And so what they did was they decided Based on the perceptual map, I'm going to offer something that is light. That was called Miller Light. And because of that, they opened up a whole new part of the market. Now, some people make the mistake of thinking, oh, the lesson that's learned from that is to always find a new category. No, that's not the lesson to learn, because that's not the way it happened. What happened was they used a perceptual map, and they saw a space that no competitor was on. And by virtue of doing that, they then created a new category. So it was the, it was the result of, of, of doing this, okay? And so that's what I mean by a perceptual map can also help you kind of see white space where no competitor is, okay? And this is another way to break out of the pack. All right, so let's, why don't we open this up to, uh, you know, questions uh, that uh, people have. So uh, let me start off with one, uh, Bree, that somebody asked here. What, uh, when you, what roles are involved on the client side? Uh, how long does the process last? Okay, uh, so, uh, so I've done this, this kind of work uh, you know, in a variety of different situations. The longest I've ever done it was uh, because I was helping to position uh, uh, Texas Instruments digital single processor uh, in all of Europe. And they wanted a, a com combination of a, uh, a, they wanted a combination of a, 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 a kind of like a, a group uh, kind of bonding experience. And they were willing to let it last for like, you know, a, a, a few months or so. And so we did it for a week in, in Germany, and then we did another week of it in in France. So that was a major, major uh, time commit. Other times that I've done this, I've usually done this like in about a day and a half. And uh, now when I do it, I actually have a website. So I, I'm, I make the process a lot easier for people to go through. Okay, uh, the perceptual maps we can gather on our uh, on this website, uh, we can do the segmentation on this website, we can do all of that sort of stuff. So um, it, can, it can last for a, a short period of time, okay? And, it, and depending on, on the, the, the client, uh, it's their decision as to whether or not they want to go out and get real data or whether or not we want to go down a different route, okay? And it's best for everybody to go through the process together. I will say this because you know, a positioning is just like, okay, I've positioned it, but if people don't believe in it, you know, they don't, they don't really get behind it, nothing comes out of it, okay? But if you get a whole group of people together who are responsible not only for the positioning, the strategy part of it, but also for the implementation, and they're all in it together, people get really excited about it, and they make sure that these benefits are communicated through the customer journey, okay? So this is key. Uh, Mindy asked a question, 
is the only way to do this based on your combos with clients? How, ca how can we automate data connection like this? That's tricky to do, to automate data, automate data collection like, like this. Well, one way to do it, the first way to do it is to make sure you understand the benefits that make up the market, okay? If you don't understand the benefits, then it's really hard to do any, anything at, at the next stage, okay? Uh, once you, once you have the benefits, then in fact, you could start to think about how to automate it because what you would do is you would send, uh, customers and you don't want just cut your customers. You don't want to just see, the people who like you and all of that. You want to see the market. So you want to see people who don't like you. Okay. This is the reason why in that, uh, that example that I showed you of the home exercise market, I was using a panel of just people who exercise three days a week. So I, they, they weren't like, you know, I didn't go to like Peloton and say, give me all your customers. Cause then of course they would come out. If I did the same thing with mirror, they would all, they would all love them too. And so you get this bias. Okay. So that's one way that you can kind of start thinking about this. Okay. But if you, if you start doing it, like if you lose a customer and then you get a customer and you send them the same survey, you send them the same link so that you're getting a real good sample. That's the way to do it. How many segments? So Steven asks, how many segments can you reasonably focus on? Uh, as it turns out, that usually what ends up happening is that when, when you break out a market, you start seeing exactly what segment, usually one, but you can go after two or so. The best way to do this is with, 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 which is like a segment migration strategy. Start with one and then build the credibility that you need for segment two, because they're going to want different benefits. And that's kind of key. Okay. But, you know, literally, you could literally segment a market with four, maybe it comes out four or six segments or so. You can start with one segment and then migrate over time and go after the whole market. It's just that once you do this kind of credibility thing that I talked about, usually you find out that you don't really have the strengths to really be a credible going after different segments in the market. Uh, Robin asks, uh, how, how does this tie into the value proposition? Okay, so tie, you know, a lot of people think about value propositions. Value propositions are kind of like more external uh, kinds of things that people put out. That I just kind of think of value propositions as kind of the external stuff that you communicate. The, the positioning is not a, the positioning statement that I work with is not a pretty document. It's not, it's not pretty in any sort of way. It's, think of it as like the foundation of a house. Foundation of a house is not pretty, but you can build a house on top of it. That's really marvelous. And it doesn't get blown down by the wind because you're on a sturdy foundation. So the value proposition can be built on the positioning as external communication. Okay. Benefits generally align with key problems. So if somebody asks this question, are benefits generally? Yes. Okay. So a lot of people think, and this is a good, good, good question because I've run into a lot of people who say, okay, let's focus on customer pain. Okay. Do customers want pain? <laughs> Do you want pain? No, what you want is something that relieves the pain. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, what you really want is you, you want, you, you want the benefits that customers are looking for. So goals are not, are not benefits. Pain is not benefits, but benefits allow you to reach your goals and benefits solves your pain. And that's really the difference. So, uh, the, the recommend that we should dig into this topic would be the book that, that my wife and I are writing. Unfortunately, uh, we're sending the final copy to the uh, publisher next week. And uh, it's gonna be up to them to kind of like decide on like exactly when they want to uh, launch this out. But nobody ever, nobody's ever written on this. Um, there are books on, there are, there's one book that I know of that talks about benefits, but they're really, they're not really specifying it very well. Uh, there's a book called Brand Admiration. Uh, that's actually a book that my wife wrote with two of her colleagues. And, uh, uh, and 
And uh, that would be a good book if you really want to dig into like what is uh, brand admiration and what are these benefits and, and how, how can I use this in my company? All right, so Andrea asks another good question. How do you implement this benefit across different audience targets with different benefits? Well, again, this is this is a good this is a, a really good question. Uh, uh, when, when you when you so l let me give you an example of like uh, let's say I'm because uh, I was talking with a company a couple of weeks ago about this. They're they're like a a, a big accounting company, and uh, they they go after construction. You know, they, they do verticals. That's the whole thing. They have like construction, and then they have. Uh, let's say financial services. Okay, so they go after these two types. Okay, when you do this kind of benefit segmentation, one of the things that you start realizing is that there are customers in financial services that care about the same benefits that customers say in construction are looking for. Okay, they're they're the same. And so then that, that, that's the thing that starts to kind of give you some sort of an idea that, you know, we can still go after these verticals, but instead of going after the whole vertical and getting kind of like sending a message to people that don't really care about what you have to offer, what you're doing instead is you're going after a part of the vertical and a part of the construction sites, and they care about the same benefits. And that's, this is the, this is, this is like how you start to think about targeting different uh, audiences. But if they want different benefits, then you have, then that, that would be a different segment. And probably there's a different segment that is in the, that financial services cares about and construction cares about. When, as I say, once you start thinking this way, all of a sudden, uh, the benefit segments become really clear. And these other things like, different audiences really just become descriptions of who's in that segment, okay? So are there any aspects that are particular to, uh, yes, every single thing I'm talking about is applicable to a, sm a small and medium business. It's applicable to a huge company. It's applicable to the government, okay? Uh, it's applicable to a movie star. It's applicable everywhere. It's the one, one way of thinking about all the stuff that's applicable everywhere. Okay. And so, uh, let's see if there's any, if there's any other questions here. Yeah. I got a couple more for you. Yeah, Anne. sure. And then if we have more coming in as well, we'll get to as many as we can here. Oh, sure. What do you do when all your competitors are going after the same segment? Well, okay, that's a good question because if you go after the same segment, then 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 the best way to deal with that is understand like exactly what I showed you with a perceptual map is to see what benefits. This is what I'm saying is that if you, if if you have competitors and you don't have a perceptual map, you have no idea about this. But if you have a perceptual map, you can see exactly how you are perceived on these benefits. And uh, what you can do then is you can say, okay, I want to, I want to focus on these, these benefits and I'm going to, I'm going to really change customers' perceptions so that I'm the strongest on those benefits. When you do that, you, you literally uh, blow out everybody else because, you know, this is how Dropbox, for example, this is how Dropbox became so big. They really understood like what was going on with customers. And then they just focused on it and made it better and made it better and made it better. And right now, you know, they've got a much, they've got, they've got this very strong brand image. And once you do that, of course, other companies and other industries are going to want to partner with you. And then you start getting into brand extensions and off you go. And we'll, we talk about this in our book too, but uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, Bree, you might have another question. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think um, I have one more. So if anyone else has more, definitely get those in. Um, can you apply these frameworks to both products and services and the broader company positioning? Right. Right. Yeah, you can do it with uh, uh, services. You can do it with products. You can do it with startups. You can do it with big companies. Uh, you can do it with everything. 
I've worked with uh, startups and uh, I've worked with the biggest companies in the world, like Northrop Grumman, uh, you know, uh, you know, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's applicable everywhere. All right. Great. Oh, we got it. <laughs> one more coming in here. Has to okay. Ask. Yeah. What and does it look like when you map benefits to the customer journey? How yeah. do you approach that exercise? Yeah. Well, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, you, 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 you know, if you really want to see how somebody of a custom company that does this really well, I mean, uh, this is liberally, liberty mutual. Okay. Uh, you might have these ads in, in wherever you live, but you know, this is like a, a market that is, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the home insurance market. And they say, you know, cust uh, Liberty customizes your, uh, you know, so you only pay for what you need. Well, th what they're doing is that through the whole journey, I don't care if you go to TikTok or whether or not you go to uh, Instagram and you go to Liberty Mutual's thing, they say the same thing. It's the same two benefits. They're just really driving home so that people, customers in this market then have a recall. And this is the most important thing is to have this ability to, even if you're not buying right now, but later on when you're in the when you're in the market for buying something, because they've positioned themselves that way, uh, you you can you'll they'll come to mind and they'll be in your their consideration set immediately. I can hear their jingle in my head right now. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Uh, we have some yeah. gratitude coming in the chat for you, Alan. Great webinar, and good luck with your new book. Okay, and okay. Web development agency position their brand. Uh, yeah, so um, price, uh, you know, when, when you're like a web development agency, for example, and you're positioning your brand, okay, so price is one benefit. That's one, okay? And I can bet that if you, if you did this, you'd understand that there's probably three or four different segments that are out there. And one of them cares deeply about price, okay? And, but there's others who don't who are willing to make a trade-off. They want something that is, uh, that is good in other ways, uh, but, and, and they're willing to pay a higher price for that. But you don't see that because if you don't segment the market, uh, you'll, all you'll see is that price is the thing that everybody faces, faces with. As the, uh, as the uh, vice president, or I guess it was the president of uh, TI, uh, TI Worldwide said to me one day, he said, teach my people to say no. And what he was saying is, teach my people to say no to the segment that we should not be targeting. Okay? And that's a good message to just remember. Teach my salespeople to say no. And, and the only way to do that is to segment the market in the way that I've been talking about. And, and then if you decide you don't want to go after the segment that just cares all about price, then don't go, you, you know exactly who they are. Okay. That's great advice. Yeah. Lisa in the chat wants to know what the name of the book will be. If you can say that, she wants to be on the lookout. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, let me see if there's anything else that I've, uh, I haven't answered here. Uh, yeah, so what does it look like when you map benefits to the, uh, how do you approach this exercise? Uh, th that's a, another good uh, question. You know, uh, again, it's like, you know, if you think about the customer journey, you know, think, think about like you're targeting a segment, you know exactly what benefits they want, then make those benefits come alive, make them come alive during the customer journey. Okay, and then I just want to say one more thing. You know, when, when I finish like doing a positioning thing, I'm not finished yet. I turn it over to uh, people that I work with who can turn that into a message platform, okay? Where you can have wonderful messages. You can have messages that make people cry or inspired and all of that. But embedded in each message are the benefits that customers care about. Okay, and that's key. And then you just make sure that it goes through the customer journey. And so you map the customer journey, you map the touch points, and then you start thinking about what content. We, we're talking about this in the book. In fact, we talk about the customer journey and the different stages and how you have to map that with the, uh, 
with the benefits that you're targeting. What's the name of your, your book? Um, well, right now it's going to be called The Brand Benefits Playbook. <laughs> <laughs> I would say keep an eye on Marketing Profs and you'll know when it comes out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, okay. I think that is what we have time for.